Thank you, Melody. What a blessing. I tell you what, music just penetrates the heart in a way that no other medium of communication can. I'm often reminded and, and love to bring to the attention of congregations that the Bible actually teaches that God himself is a songwriter and a singer. You know that, don't you? In Zephaniah 3 and verse 17, the Bible literally says that he, that is the creator of the universe, will rejoice over you with singing and quiet you with his love. So if God's doing the singing, I think that it is a logical next step in our reasoning to believe that he is writing his own lyrics, right? I don't think he downloaded the lyrics from the internet. I think God is a songwriter and a singer. And we know this in many other ways as well because the Bible says that holy men of old spoke as they were moved upon by who? By the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice that the Scriptures, the Bible, just happens to be filled with song lyrics. The most obvious example is the book of Psalms. These are songs that were inspired by who? The Holy Spirit, obviously. And then you have the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, right? Who wrote the Song of Solomon? Well, Solomon, but the Holy Spirit moving through Solomon. Much of the book of Isaiah is a composition of song lyrics. So it's just beautiful to realize that God not only thinks, but he also feels. God is an emotional being, and he expresses himself through song so that we can know him in that way. Well, I'm so excited about our time together. We have entitled our series, Extravagant Love. Now, that word extravagant, some people have been struggling with that word. I thought it was a very common word. Somebody last night said, is it, it what is it again? Is it excruciating love? I said, no, no, no. It's not excruciating love. Although we learned last evening in our message off the charts that there was a point at which this love was excruciating for God, right? Someone else said, is it, is it the exceptional love series? No, no, no. It's extravagant love. Extranuating? Is that another? No, no, no. Extravagant love. Off the charts, over the top, extreme, radical, posh, luxurious love. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that God's love is the most beautiful and powerful reality in all the universe. And this morning, we're going to talk about the fact that we as human beings are to receive God's love as a living reality and as a practical reality into our hearts. We're to receive it. We're going to talk about what it means to receive God's love. How do we, how do we get it out of the realm of mere theory, concept, idea, theology, and bring it to the inside, to the interior of our hearts and minds? How do we, how do we drink it in? How does it get from God in to our hearts? That's the question this morning. Now, in order to get there, I have to call your attention to something that you probably know, but we just don't think about it a lot. And that is that we as human beings, by nature, because of what we are by nature, we as human beings are permeable and habitable creatures. We are what kind of creatures, everybody? We are permeable and we are habitable. In other words, we were made or designed to be occupied. Are you with me so far? Now, the Bible speaks of this in many different ways. You are familiar with the words of Jesus in John chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, where Jesus said, abide where? In me, and I will abide where? In you. There is some sense in which the human being is habitable. You remember where Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, don't you know that your body is the, what everybody? It's the temple 
of the Holy Spirit. There is some sense in which the human mind is a citadel, if you will, a throne room. Let's put it that way. That the mind is to be inhabited by God. Now, not inhabited in the way a person inhabits an automobile and pushes the pedals and shifts the gears and steers the steering wheel. Not in a, in a micromanaging control sense. We're not to be inhabited by God the same way a man or a woman inhabits a plane and pushes the buttons and, and controls the entire flight process. We're not puppets. We're not to be controlled. God is in the business of inhabiting us in the way that a person, one person, inhabits another person's heart through friendship, through interaction, through fellowship. Now, this, this, this idea that is pervasive throughout Scripture that human beings are a habitation for the Holy Spirit to be enthroned, to occupy the human being, comes even clearer to our understanding when we realize that there are essentially two dimensions to human nature. There's the physical dimension, and then there's the spiritual dimension. We are not fundamentally, listen carefully now, we are not fundamentally physical creatures with a spiritual part. We are fundamentally spiritual creatures with a physical part. In other words, as human beings, we are not merely of an animalistic nature. We're not just physical brute beasts. There's a spiritual dimension to our identity. We were made for interaction with God on the highest imaginable level, and we're going to get into that in greater detail this afternoon at two o'clock. But right now, I just want to point out that our physical bodies are the medium through which the mind, the spirit, the character, the personality is, is in fellowship with God. Think about it for a moment. If, if you and I were to die rather recently, I don't want to be morbid, so I won't say today, but we're going to eventually die, every one of us. When we die, what happens to us when we die? What happens to us physically? Well, there's immediately a decay process that occurs, and the Bible says it far more poetic. It doesn't say we become compost. It says basically that, that dust you are, and to the dust you will return, right? So the physical dimension just blends with the earth again. Now, I have a question for you. When you come forth in the resurrection, are you the same person, same character, same history, same personality, same person when you are resurrected, yes or no? I mean, when I'm resurrected, if I should die before the second coming of Jesus, and I meet my mother, for example, who is deceased, will I know her? Is she still the same person I knew her to be? Yes. But does she have a different body? Has, has according to Scripture, has God given her a new body? Yes, a new body. Think about it this way. There's a lot of transplant surgery going on in our culture now. Medical science has just gone crazy with what it's capable of doing. And so let's just say that on Monday, you go in and you have to have a heart transplant. Is that a surgery that's going on and can be done? Can you get a heart transplant? And when you get a heart transplant, where do they get the heart? I hate to say it this way. From a cadaver, from another person's body. They're paying attention. They have all this going on in a communication network, and somebody across town dies. They call you immediately. We have the right heart for you. Get to the hospital quick. You go in, then the person whose job it is to be the organ harvester, some people, that's their job description. He goes across town, she goes across town, she gets the heart out of this other body, take it to the doctor, the doctor does what with it? Opens you up and puts the new heart in. Question, are you the same person? 
yeah, but life's not going good for you because on Tuesday you have to have a kidney transplant. And sure enough, they find the right kidney and somebody else's kidney is put in your body. Are you the same person? You're the same person. And they're even doing full hand transplants now. A number of them have been performed successfully. And you've been in a terrible accident on Wednesday and your hand has been severed, but you're in luck because a guy who's serving a life sentence in prison has just passed away and so they sever his hand. And this is horrible, isn't it? Should I even? And they run across town and they put his hand on yours. I'm not talking science fiction. This is happening. And you look down after the hand transplant, which I think we're at Wednesday now, and there are scars you're not familiar with and even a little tattoo. <laughs> Maybe even the hair color is different. And it's a fully operable hand. Is it your hand? Is it a trick question? <laughs> it's his, but now it's yours. And are you the same person? And the answer is yes. And I hate to make your week so bad, but on Thursday, you need a full face transplant. <laughs> and I remember when the first full face transplant was done. It was a French woman and she had been in a terrible accident and she needed serious cosmetic surgery and they said that the reconstruction would be so complete that we may as well give you a whole new face. And so they literally, do you want me to tell you? They literally cut off another person's face, peeled it off, <sighs> and then they peeled her face off and put the new face on this French woman. She went through the healing process. She came through the surgery successful. She looked in the mirror for the first time and said, whoa, <laughs> I thought I was better looking than that. <laughs> and she proceeded to pick up her bad habit of smoking. And the French people were criticizing her in the public media. How dare you smoke with someone else's face? <laughs> but the truth is that now it was her face. Question. You've been through all these transplant surgeries all week long. New heart, new kidney, new hand, new face. Are you the same person? Yes. You're the same person. Because what defines personhood? I mean, seriously, the Bible says that we will die, we will return to the dust, and then we will be resurrected and receive what the Bible calls a glorious body like unto his glorious body in the book of Philippians chapter 3. That is, we will receive a glorified body like the body that Jesus presently has as a human being and as fully God but glorified, right? Right? So, so there's something more to you and me than appearance. There's something more to us than merely the body. And some of us, quite frankly, we're done with this model and we're looking forward to the new one, aren't we? Yes, I can't believe it. Just recently I noticed, I said to myself, wow, I used to wake up in the morning and come to immediate consciousness and hit the ground running. And now I have to sit on the edge of the bed for a good, I don't know, 30, 45 seconds and get some momentum and just kind of wander around the room a little bit to get it going. We're changing. We're in the process of dying. But praise God, there is a resurrection from the dead and a new body. But there's something more to you and me. The Bible tells us very clearly in Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, that in him, that is in the Lord Jesus Christ in his human form, in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. You've read this. But then the next verse says, and King James, New King James Version, and you are complete in him. 
But the Greek is the same as in the previous verse. It literally reads that in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, and you are made full of the Godhead in him. In other words, the human being was made to be inhabited by God. Now, the question is at this point, what does that mean in a practical sense? In what practical way do we become inhabited by the Lord? Turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. This is our text this morning. This is our key text, and we'll be looking at a number of them, but this is, this is the bottom line here. Ephesians chapter 3, starting with verse 14, the Apostle Paul is engaging in a marvelous prayer for all believers, for you and for me. And uh, if you ever, if you ever have, have a prayer block and you don't know what to pray about and you're at a loss for words, open to Ephesians chapter 3 and make this your prayer for yourself and for anybody else that you care about. Verse 14 of chapter 3 of Ephesians, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see here that Paul's on his knees. He's in prayer. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Verse 16, here's the prayer. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit. Where, everybody? In the inner man, in the inner person. So Paul is beginning his prayer by asking that the Lord will give you and me strength in the inner person. Now he goes on in verse 17 and explains the practical ramifications of this strength in the inner man, where it comes from and what it is. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell where? In your hearts. Is that a statement about the physical organ we call the heart? that pumps blood through the body? No. This is the word heart as the center of life in the body being used as a metaphor, as a symbol for the mind, for the emotions, for the perceptions, the thought process, the motives, all of that inner stuff that makes up the identity of the human being. Because every one of us, we have a personhood, a character, a collection, a whole history of thoughts and feelings and experiences and memories, and we all have a history, don't we? We've all had things said to us that register deep inside us, maybe words that were not positive, like you'll never amount to anything, and it registered and it directed some part of our life, or maybe positive words, you are incredible and I love you, and I'll never, ever ever stop loving you. And those words register, and they shape your identity. They shape your character. All of these outside influences through our relationships make us who and what we are. But the Bible tells us that God wants us to have the ultimate relational encounter with Him. So that in relationship with Him, He will feed into our minds, into our hearts, the truth about Himself and about how He regards us in His eyes. And the Bible says that the truth of God's love for you and me will set you free. There will be liberation from all the bad data, if you will, that's been downloaded into your hard drive, so to speak. You've been told things. You've been treated certain ways. You've been hurt. Some of you have been through the horrific rejection of divorce. Some of you have had children that you loved with all your heart, and they walked away. Other ones of you have experienced what it's like to love somebody only to not be loved in return. And it's shaped you, it's defined you, it's made you in some serious degree who you are. And God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to enter into a process of erasing all that bad data. 
until there is no more remembrance of sin. The shame and the guilt, both true and false, sometimes there is guilt that we feel that is valid. We've done wrong and we feel bad for it and we need in repentance and confession to have that guilt resolved, right? Other times, even though we know God has forgiven us because His Word promises that He has, for some reason, because of our negative relationships, we can't even imagine that God has genuinely forgiven us. And yet He has. And He says, I want you to have an encounter with me so that I can heal the deep wounds and hurt that you have experienced through life. And so that I can define you in my eyes and you can begin to believe about yourself what I believe about you. And what I believe about you is that you are my son, you are my daughter, and I love you with a love that has no bounds. And I will safely lead you to the other side. This is what's happening as Paul prays that we would be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith. That's the believing process. Faith is the mental process of agreeing with God. It's the process of saying, yes, amen, I agree. God's opinion is the valid one. Jesus died for me, and I trust that that sacrifice is for me, for me by name. So Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. But now watch where Paul goes, because this is just absolutely brilliant. He says, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, comma, that you being rooted and grounded in something. In what, everybody? in love. He's using an agricultural metaphor here. Did you catch it? Rooted and what? Grounded. There's a sense in which you and I as human beings, we have a root system. In other words, there's a part of us that, that, that takes root, that reaches down into the soil of the surrounding influences in our lives. I come from the Pacific Northwest, and we have what are called ponderosa pine trees. Some of them are just massive. They're huge. And I remember learning one simple little fact, and that is that one ponderosa pine tree, during the process of the hot summer months, each day, each 24-hour period, one ponderosa pine tree will draw up through its root system approximately five bathtubs full of water up into its foliage and its uppermost branches. It's drinking, it's drawing. All of those roots that are reaching down into the soil are like straws. Can I put it that way? And the tree is, this isn't a great word, the tree is sucking. The tree is, is, is drawing up into itself the nutrients that are in the liquid that are in the water that it's drawing up, that are free-floating molecules, vitamins, minerals, drawing it all up. Paul says, you as a human being, you have a root system, mentally, emotionally. You have a root system, and you need to plant yourself. You need to root yourself specifically, Paul says, in the love of Christ. This is the most concentrated form of spiritual nourishment you can partake of, the love of Christ. And he says, become rooted and grounded in love. And then he unravels the metaphor, the agricultural metaphor. He's speaking symbolically so far, roots and get grounded and draw it up. But then he tells us in more practical, straightforward, non-symbolic language how it happens. Verse 18, that you may be able to, what's that word in your version? Comprehend with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ. To what? To know it. To comprehend it. To understand the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Now watch this. So that you may be filled with 
all the fullness of God. There's our habitation language again. There's this idea that the human being is a habitable creature and that God is to fill us to the full with all his fullness. And how does he do it, according to Paul? By his love taking up space in our hearts and minds. By his love crowding out all the negative history and the negative memories and the sin and the guilt and the shame. His love is to take up space in our thinking and feeling process. And Paul says that this happens through comprehending it. And I want to just, I just want to emphasize this. This is a very practical thing we're talking about. It's not mystical. It's not distant. It's not, it's not just a theory. If you want to know where you and I can engage with God on the most practical level, actually do something, okay? We can't do anything to earn our salvation. We can't do anything by way of good works to merit His love. We can't save ourselves. We're not saved by works. But listen, there is something you and I can do. As free moral agents, we can root ourselves in the love of God. We can intentionally, deliberately engage our minds and our hearts in a process of comprehending the love of Christ. What does it mean to comprehend something? Throw out some synonyms. To understand it. To grasp it, to wrap the mind around the subject. Now, now here's what I believe Paul is saying, and this is testified to throughout Scripture, and that is this. To the degree that I know and believe, that I comprehend the love of God for me and for all others, to the degree that I comprehend God's love, to that same degree precisely, Will my heart and mind and life be filled with the fullness of God? And to the degree, conversely, on the, the negative flip side of, of this, to the degree that I believe lies about God and about His love, to the degree that I harbor false conceptions about his character and his attitude toward me, his feelings, his thoughts, to the degree that I harbor any falsehood about the character of God, to that degree I will find myself distant from him. Now, I may go to church. I may hold an office. I may have employment even in a Christian work. I may be a missionary in the mission field. I may be going through the motions but listen, it's possible to be engaged in all the external activities of religiosity and disconnected from God at the heart level because, quite frankly, I'm not totally comfortable with Him. Why am I not comfortable with Him? Because I believe things about Him that are not true. Because I have distorted concepts of Him that lead me to be distant. I mean, think about it this way. All relationships work this way. All relationships work this way. Intimacy is engaged in to the degree that a person feels trust. Am I right? Yeah. But trust is predicated on knowing that the individual is genuinely good, that the person is trustworthy, we might say. But even if you believe a lie about someone, let's just say hypothetically it's not even true. One of, your, one of your friends comes by one day and just whispers to you, I saw your husband with another woman. And it didn't look right. Now, you don't even know if it's true, but here's the power of information. Right? Right? Immediately, what do you feel in your spirit? Especially if you and your husband, let's say, had a bad argument the day before. Let's just say there's some context. Let's say there's some history, and in every marriage there is, unless you're deluded. So there's history. What is going on in your spirit now when you hear those words? Well, there's fear, there's insecurity, right? He comes home that evening from work, 
And is there some degree of emotional wall between, even if you don't know it's true, yes or no, there's some kind of wall there. And then he just casually says in passing, hey, out of nowhere, I saw my Aunt Millie today. Uh, Aunt Millie? Yeah, we were just, I was just going, walking down the street to get lunch out of the office, and there she was. I haven't seen her for years, and we began interacting. She gave me just the, the most affectionate hug. I just can't believe, Aunt Millie? Yeah, Aunt Millie. Why? Uh, nothing? <laughs> the truth shall set you free. free. <laughs> All of a sudden, what happens to the emotional wall she was feeling? It's gone. She realizes that she had believed or was tempted to believe a lie. Now, to the degree, relationally, that we believe the truth about God, to that same degree, we will enter into intimacy with Him. Trusting, loyal, open-hearted intimacy. Now, our world is filled with false conceptions of the character of God. I want to share with you a series of seven dimensions of God's love that will have a liberating influence on your heart and mind if you believe them. A series of how many? Seven. seven. You're saying, wait a minute, I thought he was almost done. A whole seven? Can't you do three? Can you narrow it down? No, there's seven. Actually, there's more, and I did narrow it down. But you noticed something in this text in Ephesians 3, didn't you? you notice that God's love is a multi-dimensional reality. Did you see it? He prayed that we would comprehend with all saints what is the, did you catch it? The width and the, what? Length and the depth and the height. God's love isn't a one-dimensional reality. It's not like seeing an image on a television screen. It's not even a three-dimensional reality, so that if you put on 3D glasses, have you seen one of those movies? And everything's kind of jumping out at you. No, God's love is four-dimensional. It's multi-dimensional. God's love has deep contours and color. It's living. It's a beautiful thing. And the more we understand it from every conceivable angle, the more we will be liberated in that love. So I'm going to share with you seven dimensions of God's love. If you're a note taker, I encourage you to write all seven down as fast as you can, and then I'll back up and I'll cover each one. Number one, God's love is universal. It's what, everybody? It's universal. Number two, God's love is personal. That's the intimacy dimension we'll look at in just a moment. Number three, God's love is pursuing. It's after you. Number four, God's love is changeless. It's unalterable. Number five, God's love is non-condemning. Number six, God's love is, and this is just mind-boggling, God's love is selfless. And number seven, God's love is empowering. It's what, everybody? It's empowering. First of all, the universal dimension of God's love. By universal, I mean that God's love is total and complete in its embrace of the human race. Everybody's included. Nobody's excluded. God doesn't love some and not love others, as the extreme forms of Calvinism would have us believe. That God's love is limited because he from eternity past chose whom he would love and whom he would not love. According to the Bible, what ought to be one of your favorite Bible verses and the one you should know like your social security number, unless you don't know your social security number, and then you should know it like your phone number, and that verse is John 3.16. Notice the language. For God so loved, what are the next two worlds? words? The world. That's the universal scope of God's love. It takes in everybody. You have a very narrow circle as a human being of intimate relationships, right? It's very narrow by comparison to God's larger scope of relationship with people, right? You, you know a few people on an intimate level. Beyond that, there's a lot of names, a few 
faces. You see people on the news. What about the little boy and his faces indelibly etched in your mind in Afghanistan that you saw on the news three nights ago? What about that hunting little girl with her piercing blue eyes on the cover of National Geographic back in the 1970s? That iconic face that eventually, after many years, National Ge Geographic went searching for her and found her as an adult woman. Does God know her name? Does God know his name? Yes, and that brings us to the second dimension of God's love. It's personal. Not only is God's love universal, taking in all, it is personal in the sense that it is focused on each. Now, you need to make sure, I need to make sure, that we don't allow the, the big idea of God's love for all to crowd out the intimate idea of God's love for each. God knows you. In fact, when you woke up this morning, it was, a, it was probably a slow process of coming to consciousness of your surroundings. And if you're like me, I travel a lot. It's the weirdest thing in the world to wake up and for the first few seconds wonder, okay, where, where am I? Where, oh, okay. And all of a sudden you realize I'm in this city at this hotel and you get your bearings and you get out on the right side of the bed or the side you happen to be closest to, and you know what to do. It's a slow process waking up, but I want you to know something, that according to Scripture, God is hyper-conscious of you every nanosecond of the day. In your first few seconds of consciousness, as you open your eyes in the morning, His eyes are upon your face. The first time that you crack a smile in the day, He's elated and is perfectly aware of whatever it is that made you happy. The first time in the day that you feel a sense of frustration, or maybe your eyes well up with tears, the Bible says he collects those tears, this God, in a bottle. He has them all numbered, which is a beautiful, biblical, poetic way of saying that God takes note of every tear you ever shed, and he knows the emotional condition that brought forth those tears. He collects them in a bottle. So God's love is universal, but it's also very personal. And this, this, this is because love by nature, now follow carefully, love by nature is not, how can I say this? It is not a divisible quantity. It's not a divisible sum. It is a exponential quality. Did you catch that? Love is not divisible. It's exponential. Let me illustrate how this works, okay? Let's just say, for example, that you have 10 children. The first question, of course, would be, why did you do that to yourself? <laughs> the second question, however, would be, do you know all of their names? Do you? Yes. I mean... If you take the illustration too far, you would lose track and you'd have to start assigning numbers and just throwing spaghetti on the middle of the table and saying, come and get it! Because we're finite as human beings. But 10's a good number. You have 10 children. You know all their names, but here's the real question. Do you love each one of them? Yes. Question. Do you love each one of the 10 with a 10% strength love, because I mean there's only 100% to go around, so 10% for you, 10 for you, 10. is love divisible? No. You don't love each one of the 10 with 10% of your love, you love each one of the 10 with 100% of your love. So the human heart has the capacity to love more than one person with all the love you have to give. Yes or no? Yes. It's exponential. Well, God's love is just like that, but on an infinite scale. He literally knows every person by name, each person's history, everything that's ever touched them. And he loves each one, get this, as if he were alone with that individual in the universe. 
God loves every person as if they were the only person in all the universe to love. His love is universal in its embrace, in its scope, and it is personal, very personal. It's intimate. It's hyper-aware of the individual. Now, the third dimension of God's love is a favorite of mine because I experienced it. And I was very aware of the fact that I experienced it. God's love is pursuing, or we might say pursuant. God's love is chasing you. He's after you. Psalm chapter 23, you know Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and it goes on, and then it comes to, to the end, to the climax of the song. Surely goodness and mercy, the word there is his said the Old Testament word for love, unfailing love. Surely goodness and love shall, do you know the rest? Follow me all the days of my life. I mean, you and I, we are in his sights, and he is after us. He's pursuing us. He pursued me and finally got hold of me as a young man of 18 years of age. He had been pursuing me all along but I only became aware of it when I was 18. Then I turned to him, as it were. I was running, and then suddenly I stopped, and I turned around and bumped into him. He was running, breakneck sprint toward me, and finally got hold of me. Number four is changeless. God's love is changeless. What does that mean? Well, God's love is unalterable. Think of it this way. The Bible says in Jeremiah 31, 3, yes, I have loved you with what kind, what quality of love? You know, the, you know the modifying word there? An everlasting love. That's right. I have loved you with a certain quality of love. It's a love that is everlasting. Change that around. What does it mean if it's everlasting? It means it lasts for ever, right? It doesn't have any edges, no ceiling, no floor. You can't, don't misunderstand me. You can't sin yourself, S-I-N, you can't sin yourself out of the parameters of God's love. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. By logical extension, there's nothing you can do to make him love you more because he already loves you with the totality of his love, with all his heart. God's love is everlasting. James 1.17 says that with him, there is no variableness not even a shadow of turning. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Malachi 3, you know this verse, no doubt, where he says, I am the Lord, I change not. That sounds pretty immutable, pretty immovable, but do you know the rest of the verse? Have you ever looked? I am the Lord, I change not, comma, therefore you are not consumed. What's he saying? If I were to change my attitude toward you, you would be annihilated in an instant. I love you with a love that never changes, and your rebellion and your sin can't even alter my heart towards you. God is not dependent on external circumstances to love. God is love, and he loves you and me with all his heart. Number five is that God's love is non-condemning. Back to John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then verse 17 actually defines that love. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So grammatically, the word love in verse 16 is modified or defined by the lack of condemnation in verse 17. For God so loved the world that he didn't condemn you. He could have, by all rights, but he simply, profoundly chooses not to. Could God hold us accountable for our sins? If it were in his heart to do so, could he just call us to account? Yes. But the Apostle Paul says that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through his Son, Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. How? 
not imputing their trespasses unto them. Or, New International Version, not counting men's sins against them. How does God reconcile us? How does he save us? By not counting our sins against us. By choosing not to condemn us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 says, if your heart condemns you, and will it? Yes. Do you feel the sting of guilt and shame? Yes. John says, if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart, and he knows everything. That is to say, he knows everything about you, and he still loves you. His love supersedes your guilt and shame. Number six, God's love is selfless. This is amazing if you think about it. God is the only person in the whole universe who literally has proved in a dem demonstration, a living demonstration, that he loves all others above and before himself. Chapter 9 and verse 26 of Hebrews says that he appeared once at the end of the world, get this, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. How does God save you and me? By self-sacrifice. We don't witness a pagan sacrifice at the cross. This isn't a third-party whipping boy. This isn't God venting his wrath on someone else. This is God absorbing your sin in mine and giving himself to suffer the consequences of our sin. This is God loving you and me to the nth degree of self-sacrifice. He hung upon the cross in Mark chapter 15, and they said, mocking him, he saved others himself he cannot save. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross and save yourself. Three times that mocking chant was hurled at him. Save yourself, save yourself, save yourself, and prove that you're the son of God. But the irony and the paradox is, that in choosing not to save himself, he proved that he's the Son of God. By remaining on the cross, Jesus proved that he loves you and me more than his own life. And do you know what that does for you and me? If you really comprehend it, it arouses a response. It arouses an outreaching, adoring, worshiping response. It causes us to say, wow, if God loves me like that, I can't help but love him in return. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him for only one reason, because he first loved us. His love is primary. We don't have any natural love to, to muster up and give to him. We love him only because he first loved us, and his love as a creative force has aroused and recreated in us a responsive love to him, which brings us to the seventh dimension of God's multifaceted love. It is empowering. You know 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, I'm sure. Think about it in our context right now, though where the Apostle Paul says, the love of Christ, first let's do the King James Version, constraineth us. King James Version, New King James Version, the love of Christ compels us. Amplified Version, the love of Christ urges us on. The idea here is that God's love is the empowering factor in our spiritual experience. God's love awakens in us a new energy and power that we've never known before, a moral power and energy we've never known before. He says the love of Christ compels us to cease living for ourselves and to begin living for him who died for us and rose again. But my favorite empowering statement in Scripture is Galatians 5, 6, where we are told that Faith works by love. And the word works there is the word energeo. 
energy. Paul literally says that faith is energized by love. My friends, we, this morning and throughout this series, have been spending our time in an effort to encounter God's love. Not for the sake of theory, but so that it would impact our hearts and lives. I invite you this morning